How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another one of our Lumix Live sessions this week. A uh, little bit of a different session than we've normally been doing. Obviously, this is Lumix Live, and uh, we always cover Micro Four Thirds, full frame, uh, and the cameras that are relevant in the mirrorless segment for the uh, company. But I wanted to take some time and actually cover one of the other branches of the Panasonic series of cameras that we manufacture, and that's our camcorders, because... I mean, you know, let's face it, mirrorless cameras, they're spectacular. They've caught up to a lot of the things that those out there that are using Micro Four Thirds are at. <laughs> cam <laughs> Micro Four Thirds cam camcorder. I cannot speak today. There you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um... Yeah, so we're 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 going to be covering some of the camcorders uh, uh, from the lineup today, and and as as uh, a couple of you guys are commenting in the chat, uh, we love having the conversation with everybody. So make sure to tag at Lumix Cameras in the chat. So if you have a question for myself or as you heard Jack uh, Jack Salamanchek's on with me today, uh, if you have a question for us throughout the session, make sure to tag at Lumix Cameras uh, so that we can actually address it and have this conversation. Now, obviously, like I said, the session is going to be focused more on the camcorder side and walking through the series that we have and covering some of the capabilities that the cameras have uh, that you don't find typically in mirrorless cameras. So I uh, don't feel that a question that you have has to 100% be dedicated to camcorders. We are open to answering you know, some other questions that are kind of relevant to the category. So um, with that, I actually want to bring Jack into the conversation here. So, uh, hey, Jack, how are you doing? It's good to be with you. Talk to you a lot. I'm on uh, Sean's team. and I, I love camcorders. I love video. I do macro photography. We love Panasonic photos and video. But, yeah, I, I like all of our stuff because we really make a lot of tools for a lot of users. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, kind of what, what we were touching on uh, before with the launch of this is I realized that I had your mic muted when I was going through my spiel at the beginning. Um, <laughs> there, There's so much that Panasonic offers both in the camcorder series, which as uh, Albert pointed out, camcorders are branded Panasonic, not Lumix. Um, and the camcorders are, or uh, the cameras are branded Lumix in our series. So there's a little bit of a distinction there, but Across the board, there's a lot of things that you're going to find very similar between all of these, you know, kind of different platforms that we offer as a company. And I think um, some of the insight that you can provide everybody, Jack, is 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 pretty pretty valuable when you're looking at a platform that you want to be recording content with or you want to be streaming content with, as the title of this week's stream is about, where a camcorder might actually be a better fit for you. Um, so... I want to jump in a little bit um, and really take the time, since a lot of people, I, I think, may not understand the entire current Panasonic camcorder lineup. Um, can you give us a little bit of a walkthrough on just the, the cameras that we have uh, in, our, in our current lineup now? Sure, we got a lot of them. That's the, I think that's the, we got a cam, we got a camcorder for everyone. And before I do that, I'll just give you a quick 30-second elevator pitch. The reason that I like camcorder is it's a different tool in the toolbox. Everything can't be a hammer. Everything can't be a screwdriver. You know, every, everything, everything can't be a wrench. Sometimes I want the right tool for the right job. I know, Sean, that matters to you for lenses. You're not mm -hmm. going to probably do a lot of wildlife with your 12-millimeter lens. I know you love it. I know it's great. I know it's sharp and it's fast. But um, it's probably not the best way to get a hold of a bird or an alligator. Um, yeah. Maybe do it one time and then never again. Yeah. So one of the cool things I think is cool about our camcorders is that They've got a common platform, so kind of what Sean mentioned, even if you get a basic camcorder from us, something like a 5 Series, uh, like a 580, you're going to get unlimited record time. You're going to get the ability to not have to worry about a power solution. I know that's something that people don't think about, Sean. How would you feel if you lost power in the middle of your stream to your camera? Uh, that's going to be a, a scary thing. Uh, you're going to you're going to basically not have to fight depth of field because what people don't think about on a camera like a 580 is that you're going to have really fast autofocus, really consistent autofocus, and you're not going to fight depth of field. So you'll always be in focus. Um, we've got a 7 Series. The 7 Series is the 770, and it, it, 
that's where I really get excited because then we get things like you get mic jacks. I like the ability to add a separate mic and the ability to get a microphone and to maybe do some monitoring with the audio. Let's face it, it's going to save me a lot of time in post. Um, as fun as it is, I'm sure, to be in front of the camera, being behind the camera, is uh, Sean will attest to, is a laborious kind of thing. And then you can spend three times as much. And camcorder is often about turn and burn. How can I get great looking footage and how can I get it distributed evenly? And the fact that something like a 770, which is a very inexpensive product, has clean HDMI means that you can put it to your, you know, you can put it to your output of choice and then you have got a solution. We'll have an 8 series. I'm going into the 8 series. Um, you're going to get things like Leica optics. I mean, I think that's the kind of the, the big deal is we have a lot of the same DNA um, in our current high-end camcorders, be they the high-end 1080p, high-end 4K, as you would in a mirrorless camera. And I don't think we get enough credit for that. A lot of times, just because the menu is different doesn't mean that you're not working with something quad-core and really powerful. Yeah. Um, not to date myself at Panasonic, <laughs> But I remember the days of Crystal Engine Pro. And then next time Matt Fraser's on, please talk to him about the Crystal Engine and talking about how amazing it was for its day. But you know when you know the Venus engine that we use for our mirrorless cameras, that's super reliable, has great motion processing, good codec support. Um, going from the 8 Series up, you get things like 4K. Um, and then you're going to get my, wider than av average optics. Um, yeah. The other thing that I think is so cool about 4K camcorders is I can punch in and then unlike a photographic lens, you're going to get a lot of zoom and you're not going to get a lot of breathing and it's going to be slow push, punch in zoom that looks good. Now, now, Sean, if Lumix Live, if you had to quickly zoom your lens in the middle of your shot, it could blow your focus and you're going to be, uh-oh, that's not a very attractive. But instead of having to cut away, I can cut with um, some of the things in the 8 series. Going above that, we got to get into our, our some of our really interesting prosumer um, slash pro products. We've got um, an X1000, which I really like. Again, mm -hmm. things like two card slots. I know that you won't go shooting without you know two card slots because you want a backup. Oh it's yeah. Like wearing a seat, it's like wearing a seatbelt. And then you get the Swiss Army knife features that I like, like better audio handling. You're getting things like XLR audio support. So you can add those to a mirrorless camera, uh, like the S5 with the XLR1. But it's sometimes nice to be able to have it built in, have built in into ND filters. Um, then we'll go to an X, the um, we'll go to like a an X1. X1 is a one-inch sensor, and that's a much larger sensor than you find in most camcorders. And um, great dynamic range. You're getting the ability then to start shooting things really cinematically with a lot of zoom and good manual controls. And then we go to my favorite camcorders. The ones I love, the one that you have lo taken from me, and have not returned. The X fifteen hundred and the X two thousand. Um, <laughs> yeah, Sean, yeah. I'm waiting on that FedEx. Hey I've man, been waiting for a while. You know, once 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 we're uh, uh, done with this stream, I will I will uh, happily send it over to you because it's. You know, there's there's a lot um, as as people are uh, commenting and having conversations back and forth. You know, there's. From what I can see with with how a lot of this conversation is going, you know, there's a lot of not confusion, I'd say, but there's there's a lot of, I think, m misunderstanding of what what a camcorder is versus what a mirrorless camera is. And I actually mm -hmm. think you uh, have a really good kind of analogy for that. And right before we went live, you were telling me about how how you reference the camcorders for most people. Um, oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like a camera, let's say if you're a photographer, there are, we have amazing cameras like the LX100. It's got great ergonomics. That's why people pick it up. You put it in your hand. And you've got great optics. But unlike a mirrorless camera, it's fixed lens. And I think there is a beauty and a purity from an engineering point of view for having a fixed lens because you don't have to compensate for all sorts of variables. So absolutely. Um, when you get a camcorder, and let's say something that's reasonable power with a Venus engine, first of all, you're going to have a faster reading out sensor. And this is a fixed lens camera. So I know that this camera is going to live between a certain number of millimeters to a certain number of millimeters. I know that this camera, 
sh uh, short of a massive reconstructive surgery, is never going to go past, let's say, 700 millimeters. And it's never going to go wider than 24 millimeters. So I don't have to do the corrections for that in hardware or software. Yep. I can build the motor so it only has to work within these points. I can tailor the stabilization for the number of optical elements that will always be in this camera. Yep. There is a beauty to, and a purity to that, both in terms of motor control and communication and predictability. You know, we've all experienced this in real life where you buy you know, a camera and then you put a giant lens on it. And, and what does that do to your ergonomics and your weight? Well, a lot. You know, a lot. And your camera's co stabilizer has to compensate for that. So that, that's some of the beauty. Um, also, you're getting a sensor that was just designed for video. No compromises have been made because you're having to do both things. Um, these are the ultimate sensors for this. Now, this is the analogy I use on the X1500. And uh, you're going to think it's really kind of hokey, but I, I believe this in my heart of hearts. You know... People think about big sensors, and there are advantages. Better low light, better dynamic range. But, Sean, you're a fit guy. Um, <laughs> if I had to run across a parking spot and you had to run across a parking lot, who's going to win? You're in better uh, shape yeah. than me. <laughs> but I'm going to beat you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and, you... and because the sensors read out so fast, that's what we're really talking about. Yeah, and you know, kind of, kind of circling back a bit too with it. You know, there, you um, uh, touched on it before that there are certain things that that I know a lot of you in in the comments do for for different filming jobs, whether it's more of a you know kind of spec job for a, you know a, a corporate client, whether it's a long form recording, whether it's a you know kind of more artistic piece. And I know that that's not all of them. I know that there are a ton of different styles of filming there, but there's something really to be said about looking at the equipment you have, looking at the job that you're going to be going to and figuring out which piece of equipment is actually going to get you the end result the fastest, not just from the business perspective of, you know, how much time you spend working on that file versus actually delivering it, being done with it and collecting your money. Um, but that is a, that is a big important thing that I think a lot of people over the last couple of months have really taken into account, obviously, with everything going on. But there, there's a lot of use cases where mirrorless cameras can get the job done. Um, it's, it's not a slight on any, any mirrorless camera, whether it's ours different, or anybody's. Different tool. Yeah. You know, for, for situations like uh, uh, House of Worship or corporate, um, you know, corporate meetings where you're going to be recording and broadcasting out to a bunch of other people, you uh, you know, a, a mirrorless camera can definitely do it. Um, a lot of you guys are doing that already, and and you're making money doing it. You're fun, you're you're adapting the product to it. But the camcorder market, and as Jack was pointing out, basically the fixed lens video recording devices, they make it so much easier for a lot of people where you really do need to be able to just be hands off. You need long form recording. You need reliable, uh, you know, focus ranges. You need the ability in like what we're going to cover in a little bit. You need the ability to stream right out of the camera. Uh, if you're putting it in a platform where the people you're working with might not be the most technical, uh, if you're, you know, deploying this reach. in a location and reach yeah, is reach. the number one thing. I can't always switch lenses in the middle of a shot. In the middle of a lecture, if I find that someone is moving to the rear of the stage, there's only so much I can do with my mirrorless camera versus I can use a power zoom, built it right into the camcorder, and I've got it. Yeah. Can, can I give you a dumb one, Sean? Yeah, go for it. The size of battery. Oh, yeah. It, definitely. I mean – And there, and how's that battery indicator on the back, Sean? So oh, you yeah. Can, how, how often have you forgotten to char charge a battery and you, you didn't know that until you got to a, shot, a shoot? It's happened uh, to me. How often way, have you forgotten? Way more often than I would ever like to admit. I've broken ND filters before, but the fact that I have a built-in ND filter into a lot of these cameras means it's always with me. Yeah, and and to to what's what Jack's talking about. So this is the battery for the S series. This is the S1, S1R, S1H. Um, I don't have my S5 with me, so I can't show you that battery. That's the battery for the camcorders. You know, obviously more traditional battery that, you know, you are used to seeing in camcorders. But the cool thing about them is, at least with the Panasonic uh, batteries, they have integrated check. 
so I can click the button and tell me exactly how much power is in this battery. It's ready to go. But it's also massively larger <laughs> than what you're going to find in, in a mirrorless camera, you know, battery because they, you're, you're not bound by the same design restrictions. Like Jack was pointing out before, you know, getting a product that's designed for a purpose is something that is going to really, really give you a much more flexibility than trying to shoehorn something in or make something work. I know, I, I mean, Jack, both of us are on the forums. We, we watch, we, we communicate with all of you guys uh, as much as we can, obviously, uh, in, in the different groups. And I can't tell you how many times I see a lot of comments and a lot of people asking, you know, how do I convert my camera and power it by, you know, via DTAP? How do I attach a USB-C, uh, you know, port to it or something like that? Camcorders don't have those issues as much. And I, I will make sure to say that as much. Because <laughs> the battery yeah. is only going to last as long as it's designed for. Her. And that's the thing is the amenities. It's different ergonomics. It's, it's funny, but camcorders are designed to be held one-handed. Sean, how, as you fight with that battery, how many... How many of your cameras, you know, do you, how often would you want to shoot one handed video, you know, with, uh, with your S1H? It's, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be tricky. You know, yeah, as no. good as the stabilizer is. The ergonomics are, are definitely just different. Again, yeah. different tools. I love, I love my S5. It's an amazing camera. But if I'm going on a long shoot and you say, can I have an X1500, which is a very similar camera, I, I love that thing um, because oh, it's yeah. got the amenities, you know. That's the key is the amenities, the connectivity, the fact that I can easily add. I like the handle. I, um, I know it sounds silly, but the fact that I've got a handle for the top means that I don't have to run with a cage. Cages are great, but they're not great in all situations. Yeah. And yeah, let me uh, let me just un unplug everything I got jacked up on here. But, you know, like that's that's kind of like what we're talking about is how how much more ergonomic an actual camcorder is for that style shooting you know you have you have the xlr which is basically just an xlr1 reconfigured into the top grip on the x uh this is an x2000 you know set up so that you have that that pro audio capability you have the ability to um you know actually have i'll take this off they all have yeah, lens hoods you have filter threads on it so you can still put your external accessories on here as jack said you have built-in nds which mirrorless cameras to date, as I smack my mic and make everybody deaf, I apologize for that. You know, built-in NDs on a current mirrorless camera is one of those, you know, big challenges still. And I know a lot of people online are, you know, commenting, oh, well, you know, just take out the shutter and, you know, put a put an ND in its place. It's not that easy. <laughs> it yeah. sounds that easy. It is not that easy. <laughs> with a, with a, a stabilizer that physically moves, that's challenging. And the ergonomics work well. I know it's going to sound silly, but I, I do a lot of music production, and the ergonomics work great in the dark. Oh, yeah. So if yeah. you need to know, and you're not going through menus, you've got physical pots for your audio, and then, you know, you've got superior connectivity. You've got things like on the X2000, you've got SDI. HDMI is a wonderful way to connect things for short runs. But if I need to go 300 feet because it's going into a mixer, Man, I don't want to do that because then I'm going through an Ethernet repeater, and I'm hoping that no one, you know, spills something or bends something or. Oh yeah, it, yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah, there's there there's so many applications that that make more sense for camcorders, and you know we we kind of talked about it a little bit before with you know obviously we we're kind of teeing this up to talk about streaming and, and talk about, obviously I stream with mirrorless cameras. Um, I stream with either my GH five S or my S one H depending on whichever one, you know, I don't actually have to actively use. So I've been streaming on the S one H for a little, uh, um, not the S one H I've been streaming on the GH five S for a little while. Um, since my S one H is tied up, I, uh, but being able to utilize something like a camcorder for streaming where, you don't have the access to be able to just reach up and and change a setting or or work on a camera. It, that's a huge benefit in a lot of cases. And one of those use cases that that I actually know of of directly um, through a family member of mine is actually it's house of worship streaming. Given everything going on and and how everyone's adapted, and it's sounding like a broken record these days, but you know being able to 
walk someone through setting a camcorder up in the back of a, a church or whatever platform you're on, being able to set that up, get them, you know, how to send an RTMP link to a YouTube channel. And all they have to do is go into YouTube and click start recording uh, or broadcast. That's huge for a lot of people. And I think as a lot of you guys in the comment, I know you guys are working professionals in a lot of cases. Um, and even if you're not, you're someone either getting into it or you're, um, you know, kind of just having fun with this, an enthusiast. Time is money in a lot of cases. Being able, you know, the faster you can get something set up, shot, and delivered, the more money you make in the end and the less time you stress over it. So, um, having all of those capabilities. Yeah. Go ahead, Jack. And when the point is, I have a background kind of like you do in house of worship, I do in education. And that, that's the whole idea is that we're streaming more than ever before. And even before this happened, you know, often the fact that you can give this to a teaching assistant, they it's super easy to use. But most importantly, Sean, um, I know you read the forums. Um, people are really worried about thermal management in a lot of cameras. When mm -hmm. you've got something that was designed from the ground up to be a video device, that's not a that's not something you're worried about. This is its yeah. job. Yeah. It, you know, you don't you don't worry about using a hammer like a hammer. <laughs> you know, that's the great thing. Yeah. And, you know, I want to I want to actually jump over and show some of the stuff that we're talking about, because I think, you know, obviously talking about it and a lot of you guys have been, um, uh, you know, asking some questions in there, which this is a good segue. As a reminder, if you have a question for Jack or I, make sure you're tagging at Lumix cameras before the question, because otherwise I can't see it in the uh, just just stream of, of chat that's in front of me. Um, so if you have a specific question you want us to answer uh, or a comment that you want to make towards us, uh, just make sure to put at Lumix cameras so we can see it. Um, but Guys, I bet on the other side, definitely do that. It's very <laughs> difficult to see the questions otherwise. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to leave the two shot up and I'm actually going to jump over here because I have, uh, and I'll put my little camera. So it's camera in camera in camera. Um, <laughs> that's very meta of you, Sean. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to expand our, our flexibilities and, and what we can do. But, um, what's, what's cool about this is, you know, obviously the menu systems are going to be different than what you're used to seeing in, um, the micro four thirds cameras as, uh, Jack was pointing out. Um, but in general, a lot of the stuff is, is going to be relatively, simple to figure out. And I say relatively because if you've never uh, actually worked with a camcorder, some of the terminologies are a little different, but that's where, you know, attending some of the stuff that Jack does for educational seminars can be a big benefit to walk through some of the stuff when we have camcorder sessions. But um, this is where I interrupt while you do this real quick. If yeah, you learn the it. menu, it's like learning one of them. It's very similar to learning a very cam menu. So it's learning a new skill. That's the beautiful thing is you learn this menu and it's like very much like our, some of our other products. So yeah. you're not just learning a new menu, you're learning a new skill. Yeah, it exactly. And one of those, which is actually the perfect segue here. Um, and actually I'm going to, uh, I see a bunch of people are actually using the at Lumix cameras thing. Thank you, everybody. That makes it so much easier for us to see these. Um, uh, let's see here. We pay for direct, uh, internet capabilities on the S5, S1H, so we can do this without a computer. Um, so here's one of the things with RTMP, RTSP, th those kinds of streaming things that I'm actually going to cover now, um, hardware, it's hardware based. So if there's the encoder. camera doesn't have it, it's not going to have it. But for the S5 and the S1H, you do have the Lumix webcam software. So you do have the ability to, uh, use it as a webcam, or you can use the Lumix tether software, which gives you a lot of the controls we're talking about just minus the control of a zoom lens, unless you happen to have one of the um, power zoom lenses that we made a long time ago. Um, and to head off Although any questions about that. Yes, <laughs> they are still available, but to heads off, uh, to, to head off any of the questions about, Hey, what about power zoom lenses? Um, we do have them. There's two of them. Uh, if you can find them, uh, they're, they're fairly old at this point, but they still work well. Um, you can just the check. The motors are amazing. Great nano surface coating. Oh, um, yeah. They actually, I mean, believe it or not, highly recommended. But to Sean's point, um, getting some of this RTMP stuff requires an encoder. And that's yeah. a different piece of hardware. That It's just a, a size, weight, thermal cost thing. Yeah. 
So, um, let's see here. Uh, Keith uh, saying um, S1H firmware and S5AF firmware update. I uh, we don't have any information on the firmware updates that are coming, um, other than what we said at the announcement of the S5. So, if you guys are looking for announcement information, stuff like that, I don't have any here for you today. So, sorry. Um, but kind of like we were talking about with that streaming capability and utilizing the camera for those different kind of functions, we have a lot of really cool features with these cameras that are something that, that a lot of times you guys don't necessarily, um, see in the market. And when we look at the, the X2000 that I have here, uh, I'm going to jump in the menus and show you some of the cool stuff that it can do. Um, when it comes to streaming, there's a couple different platforms that are out there. There's RTSP, RTMP, and then Jack, you can touch on this a little bit because I'm honestly I'm not that uh, knowledgeable on what it is. But then there's NDI, um, yep. different control systems. There. Um, while I'm setting this up, could you give everyone a little bit of a breakdown as to what? what sure. It is? So there there are many in this world, and I think really Sean wanted to see how many times I could say the words real time in a row because there are a lot of them going to be real time. So there's RTSP, which is a real time streaming protocol. Um, that was actually developed in the 90s by, among other people, Real Network, Sean. So if you got that real player, it's um, and that's always been an open standard. Um, it's there's also the the real time uh, transport protocol. That's going to be part of it. Uh, we support RTSP, RTP, RTMP, uh, and RTMPS. Now RTMP is what most people are using these days. Now, you find RTSP a lot in security cameras, IP cameras. By the way, PTZs, if you ever see this, that's Pan, Tilt, and Zoom. It's another Panasonic product, uh, not part of our division, but great stuff. And those are often controlled via RTSP, and a lot of security cameras are. RTMP is a real-time um, media protocol, and that's used by a lot of things, uh, often in Facebook, YouTube, Name your protocol. It is probably the richest available, and it's probably the most mainstream. There's also, also RTMPS. Um, Sean, do you want to guess what the S stands for? It's pretty easy. Security. There you go. Um, and that's going to allow you to have an encrypted stream. Less support available. We support them all. And the reason why we support them all in an X1500 um, or an X2000, and by the full way, the full model number is HCX1500 uh, or HCX2000, um, is because Panasonic, when, in, when we all as we can, we want to have customer's choice. So if you're running an RTSP network and you're standardized on that, because, for example, a lot of education is that way, you can just run it on that network. We've got some amazing tools for that. All you have to do is put your information into the browser window and connect. Um, that's really important. Now, there is something else called NDI, and NDI is really cool. NDI is not supported um, on either of our cameras. However, we have a sister camera from the broadcast division. Um, they'll, they'll get a, a free plug. Um, this is a CX-10, and they also have a 350. And what that allows you to do is connect the camera via physical Ethernet and get control. So when we talk about these streams, we're generally talking about 1080p or less. And now the reason I say 1080p or less is because your environment is going to determine how kind of what the speed levels you're going to get. Yes. Um, where Sean is, it's in Austin. His wireless connectivity is pretty good, you know. But you know, our friends out in you know, in one of our friends in rural Ohio, Brad, is not going to be able to get those level of speeds. He's got an X2000 right now. And he's probably, you know, not being able, he's not on fiber. So he'll probably get a really good 720p. And the fact is you can scale this from 24 megabits a second wirelessly all the way down to less than one megabit or use NDI. And the NDI will allow you to just do hardwired in via Ethernet and get that level of control. Um, yeah. It, it's, and then really that's the beautiful thing is when you're using NDI, you're just going to have the ability to have um, really into a great board. And you can see it just like an IP device and control it. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that that's kind of the, the point that I want to jump over to the camera with now is that, you know, as Jack was saying, you have a ton of, of capabilities with this for different kinds of uh, output that you want to send it to. So uh, in the X2000, you'll see that when you go into the network settings, you have the ability to go in and do 
streaming. So you you, tur- you actually enable that. I uh, from that point, what you what you do is oh, go back. Hopefully, I did just screw up my own internet here. Um, so from that point, what you're going to do is go into wireless LAN properties, connect to your home network, you know, so that it's it's on the network or the business network that you're on. Here, I'm connected to Gladys. Um, anyone that's a Portal wow. fan would would get that. Yeah, the, the cake is fact is not a lot. Yeah, hey man. You, you, um, you tell me it's a lie, but I don't think it is. Eh, yeah, you know. Uh, and then uh, to Jack's point, what you're saying is when you go into the streaming menu, this is where you have the options to select all those different bit rates and resolutions for, you know, how much, how high quality of a video can you send or how high of a quality video do you want to send? Uh, to Jack's point, depending on the connection that you have, whether you've got uh you know, gigabit network, fiber connection, what kind of routers and wireless routers you're using in your own home or you're in, in your own studio. All of this will impact, you know, which one of these you want to select. I, for where I am with my home network here, I can run 24 megabit uh, 1080p 60 frame per second streaming. I can't do it while I'm streaming this broadcast because I take up part of my upload there. So, you want to be just obviously look at your your network connections, figure out what kind of headroom you have. Uh, if you're in a home network, be careful because if your home network says that you have, say, 50 megabit upload, um, you have to remember that that's 50 megabit shared between every device that's connected to your network. So you probably really don't have 50. <laughs> so picking the one that works best for you. So uh, what I'm going to try here, actually, for our stream is I'm going to see if I can do the 16 megabit transfer uh, and actually show you guys what this looks like uh, through OBS here. And before uh, you quickly yep. hit start, I just want to make one quick point. You can save to the SD card, record to the SD card while you're streaming. So you can have an archival copy, and then you can have something you can transmit. That way you have a backup, or you might can get, tr- deliver something at lower quality and then upload the better quality on YouTube later. Yeah. And, and as Jack was saying, when you look at RTSP versus RTMP, there's a couple different, um, you know, platforms that you can use here. I'm using RTSP right now because I'm sending this to, uh, basically just as a video feed to OBS. So you'll notice that um, it gives you an RTSP port. Uh, the trigger here is the receiver. So that's if I wanted to start recording, it's when I click the, uh, transition over in OBS, it should trigger the camera to start recording. Um, now in full transparency, I have not tested this while doing a stream yet. Um, my internet should be fine. I just double checked. I have more than enough headroom, (laughs) but, um, if you're doing something like RTMP streaming, so if you're someone who wants to send this out to YouTube because you want to live broadcast an event. You have actually a couple really cool ways that you can do this. Um, And Jack, you actually sent me the link for this. So I'm going to see if I can jump over and bring that link up to show people the page. Um, Instead of actually entering in the long string of your RTMP link that's kicked out from YouTube, uh, we have software that you can go online, you can save that file over, and then just load it right into the camera. Uh, That makes things... yeah it makes things a whole lot easier uh, for doing that. So is this the right one? Yeah, here it is. So with this, you'll see it's just a website. You go here, read through, accept all that kind of fun junk um, that you'd normally see on terms and conditions. Uh, And it lets you go in and actually write the RTMP link in a file that then you can load it into the camera. So for our demonstration, we're looking at RTSP. Um, a couple and it's of called thi- P2 yep. and NetGen, P2 NetGen, because there's a lot of things on the on the page. Yes. So a uh, couple of the things that you want to make sure that you're checking on is obviously go into information and check the status of your connection so that you know that it's actually connected to your network. I'm not going to do this uh, on stream because I ha- it's my IP address and all that kind of fun junk, and uh, the internet is a very dark place, so I don't want people having my. Uh, uh, and any information like that. So uh, once you confirm everything's there, everything's being triggered fine, and, and you see all of it, uh, what you'll do is when you back out to the main screen, you'll now see in the top right corner, uh, you have a little Wi-Fi icon with an arrow pointing up. 
that's indicating that you're connected to your network and everything should be good to go. So what I'm going to do now is let's actually see if I set up OBS properly. Uh, I'm actually going to turn the camera around and I'm going to show you on this screen here. I'll switch so you can actually see me doing this. I'm going to turn the camera around. So we're facing me and I'm going to unplug the HDMI cable. So as you can see, no HDMI cable. Now, if I make my transition again, It's real time. And Anyone that wants to do this kind of streaming, when you're here, uh, to do this on my network, which is massively congested with this OBS, with my desktop computers here, uh, those are the things that you want to take a look at and be careful with while you're doing this kind of streaming. Um, as everyone else is pointing out there, OBS is kicking my, uh, my uh, bit rates. And that's what, it, as a live example, that's what you want to be careful with while you're doing this kind of streaming. Uh, if I drop this down to 720, it'll play perfectly fine, but that's what I get for pushing yeah. my own internal network here. Yeah, also a pro tip, if you have things like a GPU in your computer, it will be much, much cleaner and smoother. Yeah. So uh, doing it that way, basically the, the reason why I wanted to show it like this, even though, yes, for you guys, as you can tell, this is an actual live demonstration. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not showing you this like perfect setup because I, I screwed up one thing when I did this here. The whole point of being able to do this is that if you need the ability to have a camera set up and monitoring something or doing a long form streaming, as it sits in the video feed that comes out of it, as long as you're managing your network connection, your uh, the bit rate that you're sending out of the camera, as long as you're managing all that, you're going to get very clean, solid content that comes through. When you have something mismatched, like you guys are seeing here, because I have uh, I went out 16 megabit on a 45 megabit upload that I have in this network, I'm streaming at 10 on OBS, so that's taking 10 out of that 40. I have my second computer up monitoring YouTube, which is taking probably another five to 10 there. You have some, some challenges there. Uh, sorry, I'm just checking that, the questions here. Go ahead, Jack. And that's why you can save to an SD card too. So again, you can have a perfect backup. Yeah. And so, so when, when you start looking at this stuff, this is why you guys want to, you know, take a look at, you know, where something like this can be a good application for you. Um, wireless streaming is always going to be a little more dependent on the network that you're working on. Uh, wired streaming, so as Jack was talking about with NDI, so camcorders that have an Ethernet jack in it, those are going to give you probably a bit more stable of a connection because you can plug direct in. You don't have to worry about any kind of, you know, interference in the environment that you're in. It, it just causes... Uh, different use cases there. But in an environment like I'm in right now where I have so much stuff all plugged on one network hub, which is literally right over here, one network hub, it's all things that you just want to be a little uh, aware of while you're doing it. Uh, let's uh, take see some of the questions here because I see that uh, a couple people have some questions in here. Uh, 
Let's see here. Uh, okay, those are comments about... Sorry, the chat is lagged a couple seconds behind uh, where I'm at right now. Uh, Albert is asking to talk about the cards. Uh, I assume you're meaning uh, the memory for these camcorders. Um, okay, so... Yeah, go ahead, I mean, that's a pretty easy one. It's a Venus engine-based processor. So anything that I would recommend you for the, um, I recommend for you know a GH5S or an S5. Um, I would recommend V60 cards because those are v, those are 60 megabytes sustained. It's never going to drop below that. Um, and then I always recommend 64 gig cards or heart of or larger because the memory controllers tend to be more solid. Um, that's what I'd do. Yes, it can support a smaller card, but XEHC. V60 or higher is where I'd go with. Sean might have some opinions on brands. I don't. I'm really into standards. When I go to the gas station, I look at the octane level. I don't necessarily look at the station, and that's what I'm doing with memory card. So V60 or higher, um, and then capacity that you'd like. Oh, and by the way, here's my pro tip: having uh, worked a lot of events, when I buy memory cards, just like Sean, I match them. I want the same yes. card twice, identical. I buy them the same time. And that way, when I'm doing relay recording for backups, I don't have to worry about one having potentially a different memory controller or different write structure. I want reliability. And a match cards will definitely get me that. Yeah, yeah. And and obviously, um, those that are uh, other users for the uh, mirrorless cameras, SD cards, we're not going to go into details about, you know, recommending cards one way or another. Um, find the brand that is, in, in your experiences, the reliable one for you. Um, make sure that they're keeping up to the, the video rating standards that are there. And as Jack said, in pretty much any camera these days, whether you're working on a high-end camcorder like what we offer or any of the mirrorless cameras, it's probably a good idea to invest in V60 or higher cards. Um, you, you're just going to get a better overall platform. Um, let's see here. Uh, let me, let me, let me, wait before I answer that, Karen Feeding, when you're formatting cards, please format the cards in the camera. <laughs> don't do it in computers. Do it in the camera, and don't just erase. Format, 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 format. You will get much better results in any camera you have. I know. Trust me. Yeah, yeah, and I'm a stickler. Um, I know I'm a stickler. I know that, Sean. But <laughs> and uh, I, I, I can already see uh, some of the comments about saying to remind people to format in in camera. Yeah, it it unfortunately is something that. Uh, not everybody is fully aware of. You don't necessarily want to format a card on a computer. You always do want to format them in camera um, for the best reliability across the board. Um, one of the questions here are actually from, uh, from Cliff. Uh, any way to disable auto APS-C crop and block it from cropping my Sigma 18-35? to uh, No. Uh, that lens is an APS-C designed lens. I understand uh, that a lot of people are saying about how you can shoot it in a full frame area. Uh, but it's an APS-C lens, uh, and it's a Sigma lens at that. So fortunately it's not our lens. It's not our adapter. It is, uh, over on Sigma side. So you would have to check with them. Uh, let's see here. Um, Jerome, uh, asks, uh, how can you get the look of a mirrorless camera or shallow depth of field? I, I assume obviously it's using a camcorder. I, uh, there's a couple ways, and uh, Jack, I'll, I'll uh, uh, get, get, one get your opinion on this too. Yeah, not give a problem. me one second on that, Sean. <laughs> so there's my charger software. There we go. Okay, so uh, all's good now. There we go. Yeah. Um, let's do the look first. Yes, it depends on. What, so a lot of our higher end camcorders actually support a logarithmic profile, so they will they will match pretty well. The other way is, Sean. Um, I don't know how much you've experimented with this. But HLG, mm -hmm. H um, hybrid log gamma, is going to maximize the amount of dynamic range you have in a scene, regardless of sensor, because it's sta standardized. It will match very well. So you'll get all your shadow detail. You'll get your highlights retained. It is so good for live events because you don't have to fear windows anymore. <laughs> um, so shoot an HLG, and then shoot them across devices, and they'll match because again, it's a it's a standard. Um, and for getting that look, um, you're going to use compression. So the idea here is zoom as much as you can, shoot shallow, and use depth to your advantage. Get closer to your subject, have the area behind as far as way, and you can get some very shallow depth of field because you've got so much, uh, you go so much zoom. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that's I mean the the kind of core 
I, I guess, recommendation for really any kind of shooting. Um, the more you can, uh, you know, minimize the the distance from your subject that you are physically but also maximize the distance behind the subject you're going to be able to get a better uh better separation of the background uh depth of field is just a matter of distances at that point so uh camcorders zoom as far out as you're comfortable in the distance you have uh if you're working with uh wireless microphones uh since the X2000 does have XLR you could use uh an AVX system which is what I use normally for uh anytime I'm using a lavalier plug it right in your subject is still going to be mic'd you can be further away zoom in with them and just get that get that compression to work in your favor and then uh, just way to come that we talked about it. The, a lot of our camcorders are now 10 bit mm -hmm. so again you've got so much color information to work with yeah uh, let's see here. Uh, another question uh, from Cliff is 5.9K raw, quote unquote, identical to the S1H 5.9K raw. Same exact sensor output. I uh, we actually don't have that kind of information, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so the basically what we've said is the S5 is getting 5.9K raw data over HDMI. I uh, when it comes out, it's it's going to have more detail once we actually release more information about that uh, output and have more information on the overall firmware updates. So just hang tight. Uh, you guys will get a lot more information when that stuff uh, is ready to be released. Yeah, you follow um, our social channels because our social channels is where that we will announce that in press releases before it probably Linux Live. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, see if there are any other questions uh, as a reminder guys if you guys have if you guys do have questions about this or related topics tag at lumix cameras uh and jack and i are happy to uh give you guys an answer um let's see here uh keith at lumix cameras could you put the link for the tool to put oh uh the link for the uh the tool for uploading yeah give me one second i will drop that in the uh and unfortunately, it is PC only. Uh, we have already, you know. Yeah, so uh, I just dropped the uh, uh, link in there for uh, Keith and anybody else that's using it. Um, so, yeah, just as a comment, it is a PC only software at the current moment. Um, believe me, Jack and I have mentioned it. We, I know a lot of asked. us have mentioned and asked. Um, not sure what the deal is with it, but it is a PC only uh, application. Um, so I guess that's a good time to get boot camp up and running on your Mac. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's so many great ways you can emulate software these days. Yeah. Um, let's see. What other questions did you guys have? Uh, this is the, this is obviously a bit of a different platform than we've normally been doing. So I really appreciate you guys uh, all staying on and, and hanging out with us. So um, Let's see here. Uh, Jack, was there anything else you wanted to uh, cover about the camcorders? Because I know there's yeah. a ton about them. Yeah, so, well, the first thing I'll think is we've, we've said X2000 like a million times, but I want to give some love to the, the X1500, its little brother. Mm -hmm. um, internally, in terms of video, they are the same. So if you were doing what Sean's doing and you wanted a camcorder to do this, I would actually get ready, Sean. I would actually buy the X1500 and save myself several hundred dollars instead of getting the X2000. It's the same wireless capabilities, but what am I giving up? I'm giving up the XLR audio adapter, and I'm giving up SDI. But I still have the card slot, the sensor, the optics block. They are the same. If I was going to be in a streaming environment most of the time, I would actually be looking at a 1500. So don't think that they're that different under the hood. They're not. That's exactly what it looks like. The only difference is um, that has SDI. And again, SDI's advantage is it's great for switching and long runs if I'm doing lots of cameras. But I don't think we're going to get encouraged, Sean, to get more than two or three cameras uh, for Lumix Live. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for for a couple of you guys that have been uh, asking in the uh, uh, comments below, like you know which which you know show the camcorder that we're working on. So this is the uh, uh, X2000 that we've been talking about. It's our uh, palm size camcorder, so it's uh, you know the more traditional size that you would expect to see with a camcorder. Uh, it includes uh, built-in ND filters, so you know you actually have ND filters built into it. Uh, it does have a filter thread, so you can put other accessories or filters on here if you want. 
Um, Sean, it has ball IS. It is the coolest feature ball you have talked about. Yeah, no, go no, for it. No, it is seriously the coolest thing. So you notice how Sean's holding that one hand with that strap? And that's how you're going to do a, a lot of live video is actually is recorded that way. It's actually – so, Sean, I know you like to play video games. Yes. And um, we're going we're gonna to take it all the way back to the, the classic Nintendo. And I, I know that you, you're, you're into Mario Brothers. And you remember that when you were playing that game, you had a directional. And that directional on the joystick could go in what, how many directions, right? It could go four. Yeah. Up, down, left, right. I won't tell you the Konami code. You've got to look that one up. Um, and then you have BNA. So that's how co most conventional stabilization systems work. They work on a very stringent axis of up, down, left, right. What Panasonic has done in a lot of our camcorders is ball OIS. And this is the coolest thing that no one talks about. Think about a ball bearing. So, Sean, we're going to go retro a little bit. And the first time you played Street Fighter 2. Hey, man. And if you wanted to do it, you want to do a combo, and you want to do a Hadouken, what would you do? You'd roll the joystick. That's what this is doing. So you yes. actually have those cardinal directions as well as the traditional ones. So you get this amazing fluidity because you have freedom of movement. I know it sounds like – it's like the number one thing in stabilization you don't think about is that freedom of movement means you can move the sensor in any orientation because you don't have to change lenses. Yep. It is amazing. Uh, so if I was doing athletics, if I was a coach, this is what I would love because, again, it's stable – in the hand. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's exactly. dorky. I know that's dorky, but it really changed my life. No, hey, I mean, you know, that's 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 again some of those points when you're looking at what what makes the good reason for you to pick up a camcorder versus a mirrorless camera. And again, for those that are that are um, you know, that that have been here the whole time, none of this is to say that that mirrorless cameras are you know, in 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 some way inferior to doing some of this stuff. It's just a matter of looking at you know, what, what tool makes the best, uh, use of your time and, you know, to get the content from A to B, uh, camcorders still have such a solid platform because let's face it, companies wouldn't be making camcorders still if they weren't a very large part of, of customers needs and filming needs. Hey, uh, Sean, how, how is the camcorder market doing in general? I believe it is still super solid. <laughs> It's Especially explosive. with everything going on now. Yeah, it's a growing category. It's one of those things where people don't think about it. But yeah, it's again, yeah. it's about the right tool for the right job. Yeah. And uh, so uh, let's see here. Uh, there's a couple more questions here. And then uh, we're actually coming up on the end of the hour. So uh, Albert asks, uh, Lumix cameras, is there a slow motion mode? Again, I assume that means on the camcorders. Uh, yes. Yes, there is. Uh, in fact, yeah, actually. Depends on, yep. With autofocus. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what, yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, it depends on the camera you choose, but yeah, there's always, there's generally slow motion available. It's very easy to use, but on that 1500 and 2000, yeah, you've got slow motion with autofocus and uh, yeah. you've got 4K 60. I love 4K 60. I personally, I don't think for live events, 24 just doesn't do it for me. 24 is great for movies, but again, that flexibility of frame rate. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, for, for a lot of people you've seen in the uh, S5, uh, and in the G100, we now have that slow, quick mode on the cameras. A lot of that, you know, does come from the terminology, some of the the user interface that we have on some of the camcorders. So there's a lot of synergy that goes on between the camcorder uh, design team, the Lumix design team. In a lot of cases, there's a lot of similarities and overlaps between those. Um, now, a follow-up question from, or a following question from Michael says, uh, "What decibel do you, uh, can you take the X fifteen hundred to before it gets noisy in low light situations?" Uh, Jack, do you have uh, experience shooting in lower light with the camcorders? So the answer is, I, I've had a lot of experience shooting in low light, but we haven't been doing that many events lately. So I've not, I've not been able to take this to too many concerts lately. <laughs> um, so th this is what I'll say: it's a backlit sensor, so it's a it's a BISI sensor, and then. The nice thing about the 2000, which we didn't mention, is it comes with an LED lamp as part of that XLR adapter. Um, I have been really happy to about 1600. You can probably get to 32 if you're really if you're careful with it, and depending on your frame rate. But honestly, I haven't taken it out in low light env environments because we haven't had an opportunity to. Um, yeah. I've done it in environments like Sean's there, and again, I could I could be happy at probably 1600. Yeah, 
Yeah. So uh, obviously, for those that are also confused, as you know, when we're referencing decibels, um, and in- I, I'm, I'm doing ISO. I'm not doing decibels. So, uh, gosh, I'd have to look on that one. It would probably be. I'd have to do the math. I think it's plus. You got the menu in front of you, but. Um, yeah, I, I I I rarely work in decibels, unfortunately, so I'm not really and sure. And by the way, Mike Mike is asking the right question. He yeah. uh, props to you, Mike. I'm just not used to having it on the the menu for me. Yeah, yeah, you know, like so in my time working with this in the environment I'm in, I'm comfortable at uh, 25 dB on this camera. Um for the work I'm doing here, but that's also pointing at a scene that's not lit. If you don't have control over the lighting, obviously you're going to have to sit and, you know, really figure out, you know, over, over what zero DB is, you know, how comfortable you are with the noise and the look, um, low light scenarios. Also remember, you don't necessarily have to have the entire scene perfectly exposed. Uh, a lot of times it's more dramatic lighting. So it, those of us that work in the mirrorless category, you're maybe a little more used to, you know, exposing to the right or shooting to protect your highlights, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of it's going to be a give and take to, to feel on your experiences is to what, what level of noise you experience, uh, and, and your tolerances. Um, and when in doubt HLG is your friend. Uh, yes, very, very much so. Uh, let's see here. Let's, uh, let's take one more question and then we're actually going to wrap it for today. Uh, the last question actually is from Cliff again. Uh, it says, is there a difference in Panasonic support teams between Lumix pro camcorders and Cine, uh, models, uh, same U S service support group. Uh, so I, for the most part, uh, the service and support is going to be pretty similar between all of the uh, different groups. I know uh, Lumix and Pro Camcorders, you're pretty much talking to the, the two of the guys that if you're in the U.S., you'd probably end up uh, having an answer indirectly or directly come from. Uh, we have our entire support team in the U.S. here that actually works with all the support teams. Um, but typically what's nice about the way our support system works is that you're pretty much going to submit to one area and then internally it gets dispersed to the proper group or the proper person to answer a question that requires uh, maybe a little bit more in-depth information than something that a manual can find. So I, in truth, we're all Panasonic. Every group, we're all, Panasonic. all Panasonic. We have a slightly different divisions. You know, that's, yeah. you, Sean's not going to answer your, I, your IPTV question, but <laughs> definitely someone will. <laughs> yeah. Although if, if, if you have questions about uh, any, any kind of camcorder, stuff like that, uh, you know, obviously uh, those of us that are here on the chat, uh, if, you've, if you're new to this chat uh, in these streams or if you're a regular, uh, hopefully you guys are having a good conversation between each other because that's one of the cool things with doing these is that a lot of times I see a lot of you guys helping each other out in the chat or, you know, if someone may not fully understand something, before even Jack or I can get to it, someone in the chat is already, you know, kind of helped and given a, a really good answer for somebody. Um, I will actually do one last question here. Um, although I'm not going to have an answer for you. Uh, <laughs> this comes from Cam. It says, since uh, since this is the end, uh, will Panasonic come out with this? Is the, way, this or... is the end of this is the end of this episode. <laughs> yes, this is the end of this episode. We've um, been renewed. It's not canceled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Season three. Season two is coming. Um, let's see here. Uh, it says, uh, since, uh, will, will Panny come out with the EVA2 or a Vericam, uh, light or Vericam light just going to eat that up? Um, I believe what you're asking is, are we going to come out with an EVA2? Uh, again, if you're, if you've been following the stream here, you know that we don't have any of those answers. Um, I wanted to address that one because it just kind of is more of that point. Like, look, Jack or I, we, we don't have uh, answers like that. If there ever was a conversation about announcements or things like that, uh, you know, just get subscribed, follow the emails, follow social media, because that's where you're going to hear it first. Um, and with that, I think that's actually a good point to uh, round this session out and uh, bring it to a close. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and having this lively conversation on camcorders. Uh as we've been saying, this is a bit of a different, uh, you know, kind of topic as my Google is deciding to talk to talk to me in the corner there telling me that it's uh, two o'clock. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's, it's always really fun to see you guys having the conversations in the chat, helping each other out, interacting with us. Uh, we love this kind of stuff. Uh, it only helps us, you know, refine products. It helps us get information into our engineers. It helps, uh, Jack and I, you know, find new things that, that all of you guys want questions, you know, have questions about and want answers to. So, Make sure that you are subscribing to the Lumix Cameras channel. Um, make sure that you're getting the notification bell icon on. Uh, make sure you're following all the social media channels for Panasonic Lumix. Uh, whether you're here in the U.S. or you're uh, joining us from other countries. Uh, we love these kinds of uh, activities and <laughs> activities. So much room for activities. We, we love this, uh, this platform that's grown and this community that is built here on YouTube. So... With that, again, thank you everybody for jumping on. Uh, it is it is greatly appreciated, and we will see everybody next week for another Lumix Live. Take care, everybody. It would help if I actually, you know, switched it properly, wouldn't it? Um